be a brilliant tool for sowing mass hysteria. There is no better way to broadcast a zombie apocalypse. And that virality was not something I saw at the outset, nor did I grasp how much politics informs this story, or how much class plays a role, or how much Salem resembles a fairy tale. At its heart are sexual undercurrents and raw terror. It features flying monkeys and village tailors, enchanted apples, and evil stepmothers. It's about what happens when, for 23 years, you've been dying to tell a neighbor what you think of her, but find that as a good Christian woman, you can't. In 1692, you suddenly could. It's about what we see when we close our eyes and about how those images evolve. Sometimes they mutate from one thing to another. It's a story about what that touches on what's unreal but by no means untrue. And like a fairy tale, it's a story of women, or in which women anyway play the starring roles, which is written by men. Strange things indeed happen when you start to write about witchcraft, but strange things happen anyway. And often our efforts to make sense of them lead us astray into what Poe called the wilderness of error. This, for the record, is, is my wilderness of error. This is one of the six file drawers of Salem material. I suppose I hope what, it, what you take from the book is a reminder of the, of the, that the moral can skid very easily into the sanctimonious, about the importance of humility. It's essential that we keep our heads, that we question our ideas, even when that leaves a question unresolved, even if it leaves us bewildered. That's an uncomfortable state, but as a later sometime Bostonian noted, bewilderment is crucial. We'd be lost without it. It seems probable, wrote Henry James, almost precisely 200 years after the trials, that if we were never bewildered, there would never be a story to tell about it.